Hi, everybody. I think we're, we're live, um, live from the new school and all over the world. And I have Kim Deitch here to talk to him about his new book, Reincarnation Stories, and about what he's working on in general. I've been looking forward to having Kim here at the, the new school for quite a while. So when, he, when I saw that he had a new book coming out, um, I was excited to schedule him. I've been a longtime admirer of his work. Um, there was a moment when I was writing quite a bit about graphic novels, and Kim just really stood out. Um, I looked at the work completely cold, was thrilled with the vitality of it, with, with the integration of the text. I love the density of the images and the fluid with which he works in, in word and pictures. Um, he's been awarded an Eisner as well as an Inkpot. I, I, I just want to say how thrilled I am to ha have him here at the New School, where I know he's taught before. And um, he can talk to us a little bit about the history and his work process. Um, so I'll cede the floor. Well, greetings, everybody. I'm glad to be here and uh, doing this event with you. Uh, ostensibly, I'm here to be talking about my current book that's out called Reincarnation Stories. And uh, I guess to start, I'll tell you a little bit about it. The funny part of it is, if you ask me point blank, do you believe in reincarnation? Well, I have no idea. I mean, it's, it's so beyond me. But I thought, well, there's great story fodder here, A. And B, back when I was a little kid, I remember, you know, I mean, a real little kid back in Los Angeles, I remember being out with some of the kids on the streets and, I don't know, we got into sort of a deep conversation for a bunch of four-year-olds because uh, somehow the subject of death came up and this little girl was going, well, you don't have to worry about death. When we die, we're all going to go to heaven. It's a great place and we'll just be there forever and ever. Wow, hey, that's pretty good. So I went home and told my parents the good news and they just looked at me and said, Forget about it. I mean, these people were like, you know, sort of left-wing modern people. And they just said, you know, that's not, that's not going to happen. You know, it's, it's, this is, this is, this is what you got. Anymore. Uh, uh, oh, no, I do. And uh, so you better, you better make the most of it. And so I thought, oh, you know, is that right? So I don't know, I was sitting around and it actually, yeah, actually you have a scene up here exactly about that moment back when I was really little, 1948, a gazillion years ago, four years old. And um, on my own, plan B, I came up with the idea of reincarnation. Uh, you know, you, you die. Uh, We've all been here before, and you know you'll you'll be born again, and then as another person. I don't know where I got the thing, but you know the, the other thing that's sort of interesting about that, and I I, I I touch on it in the book there too, is that then I also started just musing about all this, and started thinking about yeah, I, I remember I used to wear glasses, but I never did, you know I. And now I wear them, you know, for reading glasses all the time, but uh, I never wore glasses. So that always stayed with me, too. And so I'm not saying, oh, well, there it is, stunning proof. No, I, I have no idea. I only know what, what we all know and no, no more. It's interesting to speculate. And uh, that's all. But it's also like, oh, hey, I, you know, I can get some stories out of this. And the funny thing is, yeah. You know, but way back, right after I finished The Boulevard of Broken Dreams, I was on the phone with Chip Kidd, and he was going, well, Kim, what, what's the next thing you're going to do? And I said, well, you know, Chip, I think I'm going to do a book about reincarnation. But the thing is, you know, I had no idea what that book would be. And the very next day, after that conversation, 9-11 hit, and boom, you know, I just, reincarnation got knocked right out of my head, and I... 
I don't know, I, I got on, I got onto whatever projects I was going on and, and that was about three books ago. And, but then and I kept thinking, okay, I'm gonna do this reincarnation book. But the funny part of that all is, I want to like, okay, I had that conversation with Chip Kidd and 9-11 hadn't happened. What would that book have been like? You know, cause I didn't have any of these stories that I ended up writing for this thing. Uh, at all, you know. Actually, where, where I started in this book is not at the very beginning, but that story called "The Shrine of the Monkey God," uh, about the possibility that one of my incarnations was a little monkey named Tamba, and um, mythically meeting some guy in the museum of natural history. I did that whole complete story first, and uh, actually, I was got pretty lucky with that story even before I finished the book. And uh, almost got Maybe we can see an image of that from that story. Pardon me. I'm asking. I'm asking. Um, useful media if they could throw up an image from that story. Oh right. Yeah. You know that that was. See, I sort of had an idea about that story, and because it came to me legitimately enough, I was going into you know all this stuff about me as a kid going to the Museum of Natural History. Well, that's true. I mean, just about everybody in my generation, sooner or later, the, the class teacher would take you off to the Museum of Natural History for the day, and that was a good sort of day off from school. But, you know, and, and these dioramas, they're so timeless. I mean, they look exactly the way they looked when I saw them 10 million years ago. And it wasn't then that I noticed this one exhibit but it was more recently than that when me and my wife Pam were there, and there's this one diorama of 15 white mantled colobus monkeys, and I looked at that thing, and uh, I think there's a picture of that at the very beginning of Shrine of the Monkey God, and um, I just thought, Jesus, they slaughtered this whole village of monkeys for their lousy diorama. I mean, I actually, as it turned out, when I started researching the story, it wasn't quite like that because some of the uh, monkey figures actually predate the diorama and have been around for quite a while. They just sort of, so all those 15 monkeys are not necessarily, didn't all necessarily know each other. And that was, I don't know what I really thought of that when I finally found that out. Because, you know, I spent a lot of time at the museum sketching the monkeys dutifully right in front. Of, but, you know, that was good up to a point. But then when I wanted to really refine things, I went to Google it and got a lot of pictures of it and uh, added to the, you know, did all kinds of sketches. And that's, a, yeah, actually, that's a shame I don't have those, uh, you know, because one of the ways I write these stories is unlike I don't know what other people do, but what I do is I kind of draw and write them at the same time. And like, absolutely with Shrine of the Monkey God, you know, I started designing the monkeys, designing me as a little kid and all these things. And I do that for every story. I'm designing it and writing it at the same time. Well, maybe and, uh, tell us a little of what you're working on today. I know we talked about that earlier. Yeah, well, what I'm working on now is a book called how I make comics, and I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, I did. here's how that happened. Actually, it's kind of funny how it happened. Uh, I hit this point, and I thought, well, what am I gonna do next? And I wasn't agonizing over it. I was just wondering, and I thought, well, you know, I've been in this racket for a long time, changed myself from a worthless bum into a fairly useful artist citizen. Uh, trial and error. I've learned a lot of tricks in the trade. I've learned a lot of stuff. I ought to pass it on. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a how-to book. And it was going to be, that time it was called How to Make Comics. And uh, I hadn't even got to that. I was still working on reincarnation stories. When this happened, a fellow artist of mine, and I'm not going to mention the name because it actually, I'll tell you something more about that later. This particular artist had been in a slump. It's almost famous for it. It's been going on for years. It had been going on for years. And I so at a certain point, I'm talking to him on an email about 
said one thing or another, and I said, my friend, your troubles are over. Put yourself in my hands for a couple of weeks, and I will get you through. I'll get you out of the slump. I'll get you up and running, you know, and, and I'll keep you up and running. And, he was, you know, he bought it. And so I started working diligently with him. You know, every week I'd tell him stuff, how, how I've learned to avoid slumps, how I've learned to keep things going, how to get a better relationship with your subconscious mind, all these valuable nuggets of truth that I have amassed over the years. But, you know, it didn't work. Uh, and at a certain point, I even was getting kind of sore because it seemed like the guy was getting off on the fact that it wasn't working. But that's neither here nor there. The fact is, I thought, you know, I'm not going to do this book. I'm not qualified. I just tried to do it, and I was a roaring failure. And so I just sort of threw it out of out of my mind, how to make comics, R.I.P. But then, at a certain point, I started rethinking it. I'm getting closer to finishing reincarnation stories. I mean, I kept adding new stories in the back to an appendix, but how long can you do that? At a certain point, you have to decide, this is the last one. I'm, you know, and get out of there. As it is, I got, what, 260 pages, you know, and it ends at just about the right point, but... Uh, it was time to it was time to move on and but not quite finished because that's one of the tips I have is like one thing I always do is I overlap finishing one thing and starting the next thing and so and I've done this for book after book uh, before I quite finished reincarnation stories I started working on a new book on this book no longer how to make comics I decided to call it how I make comics. Okay, maybe I'm not qualified to teach other people, but I can kind of show how I do it. And another thing, maybe I don't have to take it so damn seriously anyway. Maybe we'll, I'll just have this be kind of a good setup to uh, present a bunch of new stories. And so the way that book's going to work is it starts with a 10-page story, and so, which is actually one that I sort of had in mind to do. But then when you get to the end of that 10 page story, suddenly we pull back and it, you see that it's my wife, Pam, reading the story and I'm over to one side and I'm like, well, what did you think? She goes, well, you know, we've done better stories than this. <laughs> and, you know, I grumble about it a little. Bit. Oh, well, listen, that's just one idea, you know. I've got this story about an elephant who escaped from the, the Brooklyn Zoo. You're gonna love this one, you know, and it's a pretty good story, I think. And so we go into that story. You know, while I'm presenting the story, we show the story, which is a, a pretty funny story about an elephant named Emma who escaped from the Brooklyn Zoo and went back to her old circus who happened to be playing in town at that time. It seems to have been a, be a true story because I picked it up in the autobiography of this cowboy star named Tim McCoy, who was working the off seasons making westerns, doing uh, circus circus appearances, Barnum and Bailey. And so I present that story, but then she goes into, you know, it sort of has this bittersweet ending when they come and take the escaped elephant back to the Brooklyn Zoo or live all by itself in a lovely cell with no other elephants. And so she says, well, what's so great about that? I mean, what a horrible life this is she, you know, I'm like that. So then, okay, okay, listen, uh, here's what I got. It's, it's just in the developmental stages. And I bring out these story sketches for a story that's sort of a sequel, something that's going on in reincarnation stories uh, featuring Waldo, I, I'm really trying to get away from him for a while, but he sashays through this story with a lot of uh, Pam's stuffed toy collection and uh, various uh, animal souls living in new bodies, and it's quite a it's quite a bizarre story. And again, she doesn't like it, so um, 
that brings me to the story I'm doing now. And I thought, you know, I could, we could just be sitting here talking about all these pages and reincarnation stories, and that'd probably be all right. Then I'm thinking, right back here is where I work. And uh, I've been inking all week. And I thought, well, why not show uh, what I'm working on? And I can also, you know, explain a little bit of the process. And that's a funny part of this too, which is, yeah, you know, okay, how I make comics isn't really a how-to book. But what I've been doing, and especially recently, like while I'm working on this particular story is, I just put up one page of it, you know, or I, I put up some of this, the sketchbook pages that lead to the layouts and then on Facebook and somebody said, oh, Kim, take us through your process. And, oh yeah, take, what do you think I am? But and I thought, well, you know, actually it might be a sort of an interesting adjunct to the book I'm doing. And so I started doing that and, you know, like, for Hi, Blackie. How are you? That's my, my cat, Blackie. Uh, oh, excuse me. I'll show you Blackie later, maybe. Uh, this page here. I don't know how well you can see this page, but this is a page where I'm telling Pam, okay, I've got another one I've been saving. And I lift up this piece of plexiglass on my desk and pull a story notes. Up. And there's a note here, which, and it's true. I said that many of my story ideas begin as notes that I stuff under this piece of plexiglass on my desk, which is true enough. I've got, I've got some in there, you know, and for every five, maybe one actually makes it. In fact, the first story of this book is living under there forever. So, um, take her through this story and this is a story so anyway yeah i was no it wasn't this page this is a page i'm doing one of the pages i'm doing right now which isn't quite finished uh tim could you hold that a little closer so we could see it oh yeah sure uh absolutely you tell me when it looks actually this is the page I was showing on Facebook coming together and that was going along kind of interestingly, except that last Friday when I was about to put up what I'd been working on, my father died and uh, which is quite a blow to me. But so I figured, well, you know, enough of this. Uh, so I haven't, you know, I stopped posting stuff for a while and just, you know, let the memories pour, let people, you know, people want me to talk about him and so I did. But uh, not that I stopped working. I've been, you know, I've been doing more pages ever since. And uh, let me see, yeah, just to show you how it goes. So, so this page is almost done. I showed it, which I was showing to you before. It's really down to pretty much busy work. I got a plaque in this area. That might be about it. But even with page, even with pages, never mind stories or new projects, I always overlap the work. So So is there a script that goes? Go on. I'm sorry. Is there a script, or is it just you go out, you write write the text as you um as you? I worked on, I worked on different drawings, idea sketches for this as I was going along. In a minute, I'll I'll see if I can hunt some of those up. I mean, they're not so very far away. They're down here in a pile. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, this is where I am. <laughs> I keep a bunch of them going at the same, you know, I'm already working on this page. And how I get to this stage 
this is an actual, this is a layout of the same page. I, it might be harder to make out. What I do is I, first, uh, first I work up a bunch of story ideas. From those, I call them sketchbook pages, but they're really pieces of Xerox paper because an actual sketchbook intimidates me. Whereas something about these pages that sets me free. So um, I work them up. And while I'm working them up, I'm basically cooking up a story. And uh, I'm still sort of segueing into the story on this page. You see, uh, I start telling her the story about, you've seen those, you've seen those things on the internet where a hand is drawing markings on a cat and they sell them to you. You're, your uh, a little sculpture of your cat's markings and uh, she goes oh yeah i've been thinking of getting blackie and cookie done our two cats and i said well in this story we pull back and you see see here you see the hand but then what happens i haven't really got to this page yet um, so i can show you what it's going to be this is where the story really gets rolling. So, so in this story, we suddenly see that the uh, hand is this cat with a beret on and pince-nez glasses. And uh, he seems to be sketching from a postcard of, of a cat named Pincus, and it's a world-famous yeah, yeah. Um, I have a few questions please. coming over the chat. Yes, please go uh, ahead. Which overlap with, with questions I had. So the first one is from Jessa. And yeah, it's, sure. It sounds like a lot of your project ideas overlap. How do you decide which ideas to see through? And at what point in the project does this, does the drawing process start um, start up for an idea? Well, I mean, you know, it's just the stories, first of all, every story seems to start out as a half-baked idea. One thing I found out is, you know, you get an idea, you kind of like it, but, you know, it's got problems. Well, if there's something about you, you like, you ought to hang on to it. And uh, ergo, all these story ideas under this piece of plexiglass on my desk. What I do is I get things worked up like that every now and then I go take a look at them and see how they're doing, work on it a little bit. Theory is every idea starts out as a half-baked idea, but if you hang in there, you can get it going. Now my idea, if I'm actually, there's some pages in reincarnation, the way I preview the book I'm working on now is the last two pages of reincarnation stories. All right, let me get it out. It's, it's addressing what what's being talked about here. As I actually talk about just what I've been talking to you about, about how every story starts out as a half-baked idea. You see me explaining this to my wife while the cats are looking on. But so, and you go and look at them every now and then, see how they're doing. But the idea and I have it here, is you should kind of visualize in your mind that there is a conveyor belt going on. And it's got all these different ideas in various stages of readiness. And if you just keep back checking in on them and looking at them, the ideal that you're looking for is that this conveyor belt full of ideas, that there'll always be something just about ready to go at any given moment. And so the answer to the girl's question is, uh, when it's sort of evolved to a certain point, it's ready to go. And, you know, as crackpot as this theory sounds, and I admit it sounds a little crackpot, well, it seems to work, you know, knock on wood. Uh, piece of wood there. Uh, it seems to work. And so, like, for instance, this story, which basically, I mean, this, this one, what's basically happening here, this, this cat is drawing uh he's putting markings on on a 
a cat head meant to be sent to somebody who has sent their photo of their cat. But when he picks up the photo, you can see here, he turns over to get the address and it says, on the back it says, come now. And so he gets suddenly startled. And then the last thing you see on the page, let me make sure I get it, is he's jumping out the window, going off. This story. On that question, so, which is very much to this moment, but um, you mentioned writing around the time that 9 11 occurred. How did you manage artistic practice in that time of crisis? So, did your the conveyor belt keep working in that moment or? Oh, this time of crisis here. Okay, fair enough. I got very lucky. Here's, here's what happened with me. Uh, well, my wife's working from home like so many people are at this moment in time. And, uh, but before the crisis hit, she's first, first we had the kitchen remodeled and now we're about to do a bunch of work in this room where you see me. And uh, I thought, oh man, all these working around all these workmen. I would have been a little more panicked about it, but I just went through it with them working in the kitchen and me working through it. Because I, I had stuff all figured out. I knew they were coming and I planned around it. Well, I knew they were coming again. And so when January hit, I hit the ground running and I got this whole story that I'm working on all worked out. And uh, I, I was expecting it was gonna be working around workmen all around me, but instead it's my wife working from home. Uh, she worked over at Jazz at Lincoln Center and she's working real hard trying to save Jazz at Lincoln Center. It was in trouble, just like everybody's business in trouble is in trouble. Now, listening to her do that all day would be a definite distraction ordinarily actually it's quite fascinating but the reason i can take it so cavalierly is because i got this whole thing worked out you know i got very lucky i got a very ambitious 16 page story all worked out in fact beyond that i even i mean the story seemed colorful enough that i'm going to use the same material on the inside front cover too so I've, beyond that i've also got a, a really good layout for the inside front cover so and, uh, answer is kind pardon. of to be ambitious and uh, to be immersive and ambitious is kind of your idea yeah well gotta be you know you gotta be ambitious uh, or you'll be bored to death in this life and further away uh, you know this stuff that keeps was, you was, going I this stuff keeps me going. That one was from Will Turner, I should say. And I have one from John, San John Sanchez that says, yeah. I guess you were confined like many of us. Are you telling slash drawing the story of your confinement? Well, and then also, well, what's the first line of the drawing? Uh, oh, rather, no. what's first, the line or the drawing? Text or, text or picture? I draw and write at the same time. I, you know, I have a system worked out where I, I start, if I'm just, I found out, let me see, what am I gonna write about? Oh no, you know, why go through that agony? I, I, I just sort of pick the part of the story, that half-baked story that, that I already like. I start to design the characters and uh, the, the scene that it's gonna take place in. Here's another trick that goes with it. So I'm doing that, right? So when I'm doing that, when I go to bed at night, I take those drawings, put them within an easy reach so that when I get up in the morning, I, you know, I look at them before I go to bed. <laughs> you know, I look at the hardest part, the part that's giving me the hardest trouble. And to, you think, how am I ever going to get? How am I ever going to get out of this hole? And the good part about that, the immediate good part, is if you're so bummed out, you generally get a good night's sleep. But then you wake up when I wake up in the morning, and I'm always doubting if this is going to happen. But I've just got it worked out. 
I, I get up, I look at it. It's really incredible. Just about every time I say, oh, wait a minute. I know what I could do. Uh, what is this doing? What this is doing is me getting into better communication with my subconscious mind. You know, everybody talks that's kind of trash, but this system that I'm describing to you, and I'm not sure I necessarily invented it. I probably picked it up somewhere. You sleep on it, not old wheeze, but it's your subconscious mind working on the story while you're sleeping. You just do this day after day while you're working these things out. After a while, I have a certain pile of stuff. I must have about 16 pages of sketchbook pages for this story. It's all worked out. And um, now I'm doing it. I have and a, the story goes back. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I have a segue before another, another question. But um, one of my questions was, was about the life of your characters, which relates to, your, you know, to, to um, developing them unconsciously. But do you sort of let them just exist outside of yourself, or do you try to exert some authorial intention? Well, sometimes you can play. I mean, I've gone to creative writing classes, and, you know, some of the stuff they've taught me, if you're really strapped, you know, take your character and just start writing and do a day in the life of your character and see where it goes. Uh, I've got some pretty good old writing exercises like that, but it really hasn't come to that in a long time. I'm basically, I got my idea. It just, uh, you know, I'm telling you, it, if you, this, this um, system for me, I'm not sure it will work for anybody else, but it leads me along by my nose. I mean, this whole book, Reincarnation Stories, I really did feel like I was being led along by my nose for the entire book. It was amazing. A little spooky. This is a follow up question from Judith. I mean, some of your characters feel so strong, it feels like they just want to take center stage at all times, that they're vying for the attention. Um, yeah. So, Judith's question, Judith Antelman's question is if you were to write reincarnation stories post pandemic or maybe to return to it, who are some of the characters you would um, return to? Or, wait, well, if you were to write, re I'm sorry, I got the question wrong. If you were to write reincarnation stories post pandemic, who are some of the characters you would return as? Oh, uh, post pandemic? I don't know. You know, like, you know, if I have anything about the pandemic, that would probably be way in the back of the appendix of, of the book, something I haven't thought up yet. And, you know, quite honestly, I think I probably will address that at some point. But I'm not going to let this damn pandemic derail me from the vision I have about this book. I mean, I, that's just, and, and also, come on, how many people are, are going to write my, my time during the pandemic? How many of those are we going to have to suffer through? I mean, come on, there's got to be something better than that. The reason I'm doing this stuff is to entertain myself. And frankly, that would not entertain me very much. You know, I'm entertained here by sort of taking myself out of the pandemic to the extent I can. Like, you know, and that's part of the whole thing. The first person I'm trying to please when I'm doing these things is me, entertain myself. In fact, that's another, at least another tip of love. Way back. So I have, the yeah. I have the next oh. question for Leia. Yeah. Um, okay. Right? The idea, the, the idea of robot in reincarnation stories is brilliant, and I want one. You mentioned using other methods for inspiration after, after Spain put down the idea of robot. What are those techniques? No, wait a minute. I didn't quite hear you. You got a little broken up there. What? The idea of robot in no, now you're really story. breaking up. Oh. Um, now you sound. I was good. probably getting too close to this mic. Oh, okay. Yeah. The idea of robot in reincarnation stories. Oh, is right. Really no, I got it. Yeah. And oh. I want one. You mentioned using other methods for inspiration after Spain put down the idea of robot. What are those techniques? Oh, I've been telling them to you. I, I, I'm, I'm laying them out to you right here and now. The plot robot, that, that's ridiculous. Yes, there really was a plot robot. 
some, you know, but what do you know? So you can write formulaic stories. I mean, I, I have a version of a plot robot myself. In, re- in reality, I've never used it. I mean, you know, I'm telling you where you get the stories. They come from inside your head. And, and, and you know, you mine your head like you're mining gold in somewhere. Only it's inside your head. Uh, plot robot. Yeah. I mean, I just saw pictures of this guy, Wycliffe A. Hill, with various prototype models of a plot, plot robot for years. And uh, it cracked me up. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, oh, this is pretty, this is pretty zany and very colorful. You know, I could, you know, use that. So I made up this cock and bull story about knowing him when I had, yeah, I had a paper route when I was that age, but I never met Wycliffe A. Hill and, uh, and all of that stuff. That was just, you know, a fun story. Wouldn't it have been fun if I'd met him and knew him? And, well, what would that be like? You know, and <laughs> so that's how I I've go. got a question. Before the next question arrives, I've got one I'm dying to ask myself, which is, how do you think about and how do you characterize history? What's your kind of attitude or um, thought process around history and and your relationship to it and how history functions in your stories? Well, I guess, you know, I was always interested in history ever since I was a little kid. You know, before I could read, I'd look at books my parents had you know, I thought, here's my cat, Blackie. This, uh, this is black. Anyway, uh, one of the books I used to read like that was called The American Past. I mean, you know, it's a pretty familiar pictorial textbook. And I just, even before I got into, oh, you know, history of movies and stuff, just general history, especially American history, it just always fascinated me. The march of time, our place in it. I don't quite know what to make of it, but I definitely recognize that, you know, I'm a player in it. And of course, you're more a player if you really choose to be a player. And I choose to be a player. And uh, you want to amplify on that question a little more? Zero in well, a little more? You know, it's interesting to me as well that there's a kind of a sense that there's real history versus. Um, the history that we know. So the stories start oh. with a kind of presumption of the history we know, which is always mediated by um, completely yeah. all uh, completely alternate universe. You know, I tried to get into that a little bit in that appendix story I did called "Who Is Buck Jones?" called "Print the Legend." That's that's a quote out of Liberty Valance. So yeah, you know, if, if you don't like the way it really went down print the legend and yeah and there is something sort of valuable about that and and like in the case of buck jones a story immediately popped up after he was killed in that terrible coconut grove fire that oh you know the first time i ever heard of him and somebody was talking about him they just presented that as fact oh yes the truth is buck jones got out of out of that building and rescued several people and then finally he went in for the third time and that was it you know and because it you know, nobody could stand that this kind, wonderful guy died. And so they came up with this. And, you know, I knew the story wasn't true. Uh, you know, I have an, a definitive biography that really explains what happened, which is just horribly depressing. But uh, I thought, well, let's print the legend, too. I mean, because it's, it's, a, it's a nice story. <laughs> it's yeah. Too bad it wasn't like that. And, uh, I'm also curious before another question pops up is you're kind of there's seems like a real um dichotomy between new york storytelling versus hollywood storytelling and it i mean to me it plays in a little bit um with your history with your family background as well as your east village history and that these are somehow two very different um ideas of what history is and what storytelling is i don't know if that's if that's an intention or if it's a thematic element, um, New York uh, versus L.A. Well, L.A., you know, seemed like a fabulous place. It's where I emerged into consciousness. Uh, my father worked for CBS Radio. He used to take me over there, uh, and it's all kind of misty and distant. New York. Oh, I could tell stories. I could dine out on stories about you know 
getting started in comics on the Lower East Side. And it is an actual fact that I used to have to walk in and out of my building with a loaded gun and successfully defended myself on a number of occasions. Because once you get, you know, once you've been mugged once, one thing about that kind of thing is if they succeed once, they always come back. So I know when this guy got me at knife point going up the stairs one day that he'd be back. Well, it just so happened that uh, somebody had left a 32 Saturday night special type gun and lots of bullets at our place. I never, you know, I'm not a gun person. I never went near it. So that happened. I went over to the shelf, I took that gun, I put it in my jeans, and sure enough, boy, three days later, fucking turkey was back. And, and, and again, I, did, I, I, did, I didn't look for a confrontation. I was a six-flight walk-up. I thought, oh, here he comes again. I just uh, I just started thundering up the stairs, and I, all, I got all the way there. And, you know, crummy police lock wasn't working. When I, you know, I had my hand on the lock. Suddenly, there's this guy again. So, you know, I reached into my jeans and I pulled out this gun. And it was like, uh, uh, uh. but boy, it didn't matter. That guy disappeared like a cartoon character in a Tex Avery cartoon. And that was exhilarating. You know? <laughs> and the second time it happened, some punk started trying to run some routine on me on the street when I was coming home. So said, I like that jacket he used. I think I want that jacket. I think you're going to give me that jacket. And I, I said, listen, I don't provoke. And I was just sort of walking backwards, 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 till we got into the, 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 the out of sight and off the street. And I just pulled out that gun. And said, listen, man, and boom, he was gone. I saw him about a week later walking down Second Avenue. And I just gave him my word. You know, I gave him my Terry eyeball. I had it with me. You know? <laughs> and he just walked along. <laughs> So, uh, so the difference between, I can remember. Oh, the, New York. Uh, the, yeah, we want to go back to it. The difference between, uh, uh, L, you know, California in was a sort of fabled place and uh, New York City was a get down dirty place. And, uh, you know, and I'll tell you, living on the Lower East Side, you know, I tell these stories to people. But I don't like to tell them that much. But uh, I said, but there's something else you got to know. And, it wasn't like some romantic thing, man. I was walking around with a permanent knot in my stomach all the time. And that's the truth. Yeah. So New York is a grittier place. And it's a harder place. I mean, when we moved to New York City, there's something about New York City. I've come to, to like it. I regard myself as a New Yorker. But boy, our first impression, my folks and me, when we got to New York, Jesus, people are so mean around here, you know. Nobody has a good word for you. you and uh, I felt that for a long time. I went back and did a, a long stint back in California before I came back here, got married and settled down where I am now. And my current read on that is, look, you know, in L.A., people are real nice. You hear a lot of moonshine. People talk a lot of shit to you. You know, they'll yes you to death. New York, yeah, they're not so nice, but at least you know where you stand. You know, and uh, I've come, you know, and anyway, am I such a nice guy? I, after a while, I said, well, I sort of fit in here. I mean, you know, I'm no sweetie pie either. So uh, New York is a grimmer, tougher place. Well, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker now. I like it here. So I have a question from Caitlin Irwin. Um, yeah. And so can you pick a favorite character from reincarnation stories? Yeah, I'd say Jack Hoxie. You know, that, doing that story, cooking up that imaginary uh, encounter with him. Uh, I'll treasure that. You know, and all the stories he tells me is a little... As, as a teenager, they're, they're all true. I got them out of a, a biography about him. And Dan, maybe the, we can pull up an image from that if you're there. Pardon, pardon me? Oh, I yeah. was asking Dan if we could pull up that image if he's there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, so, so that story was very fulfilling for me to do. The story of like 
of the best day of my life from up to that point at age about 15. You know, because, you know, it's thing is I've reading this biography of him and, and they, they showed how well, you know, after he was a movie star, he went back for a while, he worked in the rodeo. When, they, you know, he's getting too old to do that stuff, he just started working in these little decrepit one-horse Western shows that weren't really rodeo shows at all. And there was a picture of him with his wife and his dog from 1958. And I thought, 1958, and he still looks pretty much like himself. And I thought, hell, I could have known this guy. And so that statement led to, well, what if I did? You know, we used to travel on these car vacations a lot, you know, and I was in Virginia, you know, we'd go to folk festivals and this and that. I said, well, what if we went to the folk festival and it wasn't there and old Jack Hoxie was there. And so that's how that story evolved, you know, and so that, you know, I, I, I'm sure that won't be most people's favorite character in there. I wouldn't know what their favorite is. But since you ask, off the top of my head, that's mine. I've got a, um, another question that I want to be sure to get to. So I'm going to yeah. jump here, which is in, um, in Pictorama, I remember you discussed the idea of picto fiction, which I guess goes back to the yeah. East comics and the kind of weird tales there was stuff like that in there as well yeah um but i you know that was an idea that really interested me at the time it still fascinates me in terms of its long history but it always yeah. feels to me like it never quite happens um i don't know if you have that feeling as well but i i wanted to ask about it well it's come pretty darn close sometimes i mean you know uh one of the things that was influencing me a lot was like the illustrated novels of the Victorian era, you know, like uh, Dickens, he was his own art director. He hired those guys and told them, well, I want a picture and this is what it's going to be. And, you know, so, and then Thackeray went in one better. If you get a, a good and edition. Thackeray was drawing them. I think. Pardon me? Didn't, wasn't Thackeray drawing? I think Thackeray did the drawings in the marginalia, didn't he? He, um, he actually tried out for the Pickwick papers, but didn't get the gig. And uh, yeah, he'd done he'd done different illustration jobs, but uh, Vanity Fair is arguably, and I think it is true, his greatest book. I mean, if all of Thackeray's books were as good as Vanity Fair, he'd be Dickens' equal. But they aren't, of course. They aren't, so he's not. But Vanity Fair is a pip, and there's 190 pictures in that book. I mean. You know, so that's getting pretty close. But then move forward a little bit. One of Thackeray's illustrators, when Thackeray wasn't illustrating his own work, was uh, George du Maurier, who illustrated Thackeray's novel, Henry Esmond. Well, that's not such a good book. But du Maurier, when he was in his 50s, in the 1890s, decided he'd turn author. And so first he wrote, Peter Ibbotson, which is a darn good book. But the one he's most famous for is, uh, well, it introduces this character, Sven Gali, Trilby. It's called Trilby in the, by uh, hypnosis. Uh, you know, it turns her into a hypnotic opera singing sensation. Well, the thing is, he, He's an illustrator turned author. So those books are really illustrated. I mean, that's really, you know, you're getting pretty near picto fiction there. Yeah. So uh, I devoured them. From Charlotte uh, Slipka. And it's, well, in addition to um, using sleep and um, asking, you, you know, sleeping on things, are there other ways to keep a clear channel to your own subconscious? Um, Good, any other mining techniques? Well, you know, a lot of things help. I mean, one thing I always tell aspiring students, get into physical fitness. You know, it doesn't even matter what kind, but you know, like I especially noticed it when I was a runner, when I was living in North Carolina, I used to run six miles a day. And you know, well, once you, once you made that achievement, you know, it's like, you've conquered the first real good challenge of the day. 
and then you are really ready to get in there and do some stuff. So I'd say get into physical fitness. Doesn't matter what kind. I'd say just a, they're, all, they're all good. And uh, that'll help, you know. Trial and error. Yeah. So I was wondering about your color palette. Like, do you, um, so you, not all your books have color and sometimes there's color in part and not in another. Um, yeah. Do you work with a specific, do you come up with a color palette that you then work with or is it very free ranging and the color palette just develops when you color or? Well, I'll tell you what's really done wonders for me. Uh, you know, it used to be I'd, I'd struggle with color. I'd, I'd do all these different, I'd Xerox something and do all these different color things and, and they'd get pretty elaborate and took forever. But you know, it's been my savior for color is Photoshop. Because Photoshop, man, you know, your first, your first idea about color develops into your last. You can sit there, try out different colors, flip colors. Uh, it's marvelous. And so I don't even worry about that anymore. I just, when it's, okay, it's time to color, I just get to coloring. The only downside for me is that I'm not very fast. And, you know, yeah, you know, maybe I do books all in color, except that just getting that 11 pages in reincarnation stories took a long time. It's fun, a, a long fun time. But, you know, you're sitting there working it all out, I suppose, you know, you could put it on a fast track. When I'm doing it, I don't even want it to be on a fast track, though. I'm, I really, coloring with Photoshop, when it is messing up somehow, technically, is, is my idea of a good time. So that's, I swear by that. Um, for so that's it. I have another question about about sort of how you do you try to modulate how dense the pages are with art and text, or do you try to, or do you just let it sort of grow organically? I just say I just sort of let it grow organically. You know, I have these sketches. I I just see where it takes me. You know. And, I, I spend way too much time on pages. I'll tell you, you know, if I was at a different stage of my career, I'd be worried. But I figure at this point, screw it, you know, just take as much time as I need to, to make the prettiest damn page I can make, you know. Are we going to see Waldo again? Yeah, he, he's, he passes through this book, this book, the uh, third story that I'm pitching to Pam. I wonder if I have any of those handy. Oh. I'll try not. If I ha don't find it right away, I'll be right back. Yeah. Is your cat a model for Waldo? No, not at all. No. Uh, uh, just grab a bunch of these. Let's No, never. But I, but but I did find, you know, idea pages. This will give you an idea of what I'm doing while I'm writing a story. Here is a page from that story I was telling you about the elephant who escapes from Brooklyn, just along the way. You know, here's here's me telling Pam about it, and uh, that's about all I have of the story here. But but while I'm getting my brain sharpened up, I'm getting my elephant drawing chops down. So this page is me drawing elephants. Uh, but there's some more of that story. Yeah, yeah. And so here's some more, you know, some of it down below is me cooking up the story ideas. Uh, well, first of all, there, there's our entire room recreated that's this is mostly the proscenium set for me pitching the stories to Pam she's here I'm there and uh there's all the untidiness of my work area are you seeing that anyway and uh but up here 
I'm still working out the elephant stuff. And then uh, this page, this part here is mostly it's a story, you know, based on a story about an elephant who escaped from the Brooklyn Zoo and went to his old circus when I was playing in Brooklyn. But this story here, this part here, I sort of ease into the elephant thing, talking about the way elephants, you know, when they're trained, they're kind of interesting. And this is another story that I heard somewhere illustrated here, which is basically what the story here was. A bunch of elephants were on the road in a circus and there was a big storm and the elephant keeper looked in to see how the elephants were doing in the tent and they weren't there. And then he looked out in the raining field and there they all were grabbing each other's tails, doing their routine that they did on, you know, during the circus. And I thought, whoa, you know, I, I can use that. I just had that one in my head from, there's a million great elephant stories. I mean, you know, um, rogue elephants. I mean, that, no, all of it. Yeah, I did a rogue elephant story. In, in a, you did? Mine. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's I did a tragic elephant story. Pardon? <laughs> I did a tragic rogue elephant story in Tales of Woe. Oh, any story about rogue elephants has got to be tragic. That's for sure. Um, yeah. I have a question. I have a question from Will Turner, which yeah. is, what do you think caused the biggest shift in your style or content, and what caused it? Well, I don't know. It could be any number of things. I quit drinking at some point, so that made me more conscientious. That's one thing you can point to. Also, just coming up with these techniques, so I didn't have to be going through all these slumps all the time. When I was younger, and I had very bad habits, I drank a lot, took a lot of drugs, generally, you know, a jerk looking for a good time. And, you know, my work showed it, you know, uh, I wasn't taking it seriously enough. And so I think the biggest shift was, it wasn't specifically necessarily quitting drinking, although you could point to that as being a big one, just a, at about the time I quit drinking, I also just sort of took inventory of myself. I mean, I busted up with this girl I'd been living with for 11 years, and that put me into a massive depression. Although I didn't sit around and mope about it, it also galvanized me and to get more serious about my work. I, I got a job as an art director in North Carolina. I was on the wagon doing work there. And one week I fell off the wagon and there was this storefront Alcoholics Anonymous place nearby. I'd been passing it every day and think, you know, I better stay on the wagon or you're going to end up in there. And yeah, sure enough, I fell off the wagon, 1983, and uh, stayed drunk for a week. And then I went over there, joined AA, and I've never taken a drink since. And uh, just started taking everything a little more seriously, but not to the point of taking, telling mopey serious stories. Because, like I say, I'm out to entertain myself. And uh, so maybe that, maybe that was it. You know, it, there was a definite shift where, you know, when I first started out, it's a wonder I uh, lasted this long because I, I really sort of seemed like. Mr. Most Likely Not to Succeed. And, you know, I probably would have gone. I mean, all my drinking buddies, I mean, I can think of one who's still around because he quit drinking, the drummer of the Fugs. He's still around. But, but like, most of my drinking buddies are, are long gone or they lost their mind and they're in a rest home now, you know. Uh, so, yeah, cleaning up my act so I could... Well, this is well into the next question from Judith Antelman, which is in reincarnation stories, you ask, what does it all mean? On page 210, you write, I do know this. We must only use our powers for good. So yeah. is it, um, do you think that's what it all means? I don't know. You know where I got that? That's just the, you know, the celebrated wheeze you read in a, a million superhero comics. 
you know, or old man Shazam's got his hand on young Captain Marvel's shoulder or Billy Batson's shoulder. My son, you must only use your powers for good. And in fact, you know, the last story in, in, in the book I'm doing now, How I Make Comics, is going to be a period piece. It's going to be a superhero story and not a send-up of a superhero story, but an actual about a, a guy who's addicted to comic books and you see them lying around in, in his house and he's basically he takes that tenant you must only use your, your powers for good to heart becomes a he becomes a superhero but i think in an interesting different way his mentor is his father who died in prison and has been reincarnated as a rat and uh who's sort of guiding him along through different adventures although I don't know if I'll actually tell the adventures. My story is the origin story of how it all came about, which is basically the storyline that Pam came up with, uh, reformatted to tell this particular story. I think it's good. I hope it's good. I mean, I'm starting to sweat because that's the next one up after uh, uh, the one I'm that looking was at. Kind of a superhero story. Pardon me? Alias the Cat was kind of a superhero story. Sort of, yeah. That up till then, that was the closest thing I'd ever done like that. You know, and you know, I'm not looking to suddenly go superhero, but I'm I, I'm looking forward to giving it a shot one time, and not a satiric shot, but a real shot, just because I think I have something interesting to do with it that transcends just being an asinine superhero story, which God knows I've read enough of. You know, I like their energy off, you know, even when they're, you know. Uh, I have a question from Natalia Gomez, which is, you mentioned practicing your elephant drawings. Is there anything you find particularly hard to capture? Well, uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's just that, you know, I, I had to get it figured out. And I'll give you a good tip about that. It, you know, it used to be... If you're an artist, you'd have a morgue full of pictures that you worked from. Or maybe you'd have a whole filing cabinet. But you know what my morgue is? Google Images. I mean, you know, and, and that's, you know, how I got my elephant chops together. I just went to Google Images, got all these pictures. You know, some of them I threw out. And then, you know, just for openers, I just started flat out copying some. I mean, these are flat out copies, these up here. And until after a while, I started to get more comfortable and, uh, you know, working out my own poses. Here's a good segue. So, some copying going on, but then it's starting, I'm starting to, you know, get a feel for the character, give them their own interesting look. And uh, while you're doing that, the wheels are turning inside your head of how the story's going to go, you know. Yeah. This is like uh, segueing into the Tim McCoy part. There's a picture of Tim performing at the Barnum and Wheel Circus back in the late 1930s. Boy, I hope I don't sue my ass for using that story. But, uh, <laughs> I think that last image um, leads to a, another question. Maybe it's kind of two parts, but some of your images, you, you seem to like intentionally give them a very stiff quality. And sometimes they seem very fluid, like Waldo at times seems almost boneless, you know, at moments. And then other times the characters have a very kind of frozen in time move, time aspect. And I'm wondering how you think about that, if it's, if it's sort of pacing or if it's how you want us to feel the characters in that moment. Oh, it's just me struggling with how to draw, I think, you know, uh, you know, there, some people are natural born artists and that's great. God will bless them, you know, and others are like, in my case, I'm really more of a writer who draws. I, I figured it out. I'm figuring it out. Uh, my father, you know, I visited him in, Czechoslovakia in 1962, right after I was out of school. And he's sitting, you know, we're sitting around talking and he goes, you know, Kim, when I was your age, I could draw circles around you. 
you know, you you just you. I don't think you really necessarily have it. Now you're a pretty good writer, and if you want to stay here, I'll send you to school, learn the language, and we'll send you to writing school. I bet you we could probably make a pretty good writer. Well, you know, yeah, I wasn't seeing that. You know, but but what it did come down to. So then, you know, when I got back, oh, I went to Pratt Institute for a couple of years. But, you know, and I was getting by there. But you know, part of my problem was I wasn't really digging the work they were doing so much. One night I went, I went out and drank it, and I met this Norwegian seaman. And he said, "Oh yeah, I've been all over the world. You know, I did this and I did that. And you could do it too. You know, there's." Siemens unions all over Brooklyn. And if you got a passport, you know, you could be on your way in no time at all, all over the world. So, so I uh, finished honorably my second year at Pratt, took a leave of absence, and uh, got on a Norwegian tramp steamer off to, off to Japan and stayed on it for the next six months. And I was, and before when I got back, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to go back to Pratt. And uh, so I just worked a lot of working stiff, straight jobs. And that was good for me just to get, you know, punch a time clock and get out there in the real world, see what the real world is like. But at a certain point, I started thinking, you know, this is, this is no, you know, so what are you going to do with your life? I'm 20 years old and uh, 21. And, uh, I thought, you know, maybe I could give this another shot, uh, you know, but I'll just try to, uh, and I, I sort of segued into it, doing paintings, semi-abstract, some were more figurative. They were immediately successful. I was selling them, you know, I was, or leaving, you know, I wasn't making, I wasn't getting rich, but I said, you know, I can make a living with this. But then, uh, you know, paintings weren't quite satisfying me, and I, I just suddenly, uh, comics, I thought, well, I'd be good, but I don't know how to draw, you know? But then I thought, well, maybe I can figure it out. You know what happened to somebody? I was working as a child care worker at a certain point, and I was showing them all my art, and you could sort of see it evolving into comics, and all the way to a few of them. I had done a few comics, and I was even using a character who later became the Waldo. And this guy was looking at him, and he was going, yeah, these are pretty. I said, you know, I'd love to be a true comics, but I just don't know. You know, I just can't draw that well. And he said, well, these are better than Captain High. I said, Captain High? What's that? He said, did you ever hear of this underground newspaper called the East Village Other? It's a, it's a comic strip in there. And uh, so I went and dug some of them. I can draw as good as this guy. If he's getting away with it, maybe I can too. I had a, I quit my job as a child care worker. I had $500 in the bank. I withdrew it, closed out my account, went down to the Lower East Side. I wasn't sure whether I was going to be a painter or what. But somehow, one thing led to another. And about, a, I'd say a year and change after that, I was on salary at the East Village Other drawing comics. I mean, I don't want to sound smug or anything, but I think about my life. And, and the funny part of it to me is that I sort of succeeded by doing all the wrong things. You know, you know, all these moves that didn't seem like they were going to get me anywhere. They got me somewhere. You know, and uh, I think I can understand what that was because I was sort of schooling myself and becoming a better person. You know, one thing I was always addicted to, and still am to some extent, are self-help books. And, you know, you can just get a lot of tips on how to organize your life from those things. And I certainly have. So I'm going to put out a last call for questions. Yeah, bring them on. Um, anyone else? No more questions. Other questions.
Well, what do you want to do? You want to see some more pictures? or? Uh... Why don't we look at a couple more pictures for our last five minutes or so? Yeah, I, I'm hoping I can find what I'm looking for. What happened to all the forty-year-old uh, Chinese catfish? Damn. You know, I, mean, I only got this idea to take you through this thing at the last minute, so it's not like I have it all organized out. Uh, but I did see one picture you might appreciate since you live in Brooklyn. Okay. You do. You do live in Brooklyn, right? Oh, oh I guess that's the, the tech guy I was talking to before we started. But this, this story where uh, the elephant busts out of uh, the Brooklyn Zoo and uh, escapes to his old circus. Here's a scene where he's on the rampage, and I, I give you a little guided tour of Brooklyn. You got Ebbets Field over here. That is for that cat was in that um, elephant is in Brooklyn right now. The elephant is in well. The story took place in the late '30s. That elephant, maybe he's still alive, but you know, uh, I'm a little skeptical of it. This is, a, you know, when I went to Prince, you see this building here with with, with the clock face. When you're uh -huh. at night, especially if you're smoking a little weed, it looks like this this big creature with and the t the two uh, clock faces look like eyes. And I just, uh, you know, when we used to be running around Brooklyn. We went to Pratt. Uh, I just love the look of that. And then recently, when I started riding the F train, I suddenly saw that building again. Turns out it's an, uh, an insurance building or something. But to me, it's one of the great uh, sites of Brooklyn. Not that I necessarily know the half of what the great sites of Brooklyn are. But, um, so that, this story sort of is an homage to Brooklyn along with everything else. Let me see what else yeah, I got. That building is luxury condos. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see what else I got here. I got. I mean, I got some more down. One here. more, and then we're gonna we're gonna wind down. Oh, okay. Well, I hope I have given satisfaction. Um, Thank you so much. Thanks so much for meeting us here today, and it's it's a pleasure to meet you online. It's too bad we couldn't do. Oh, anything. likewise. I hope I. Uh, I hope we meet in person one of these times. That would be great. That would be great. Yeah. And, you know, I enjoyed myself tremendously. You know, it's great to chat. let's see that last image. What have you got for us? What have I got? I, okay. Well, uh, what have I got? Um, please take too much explaining. Uh, well, Here's the here's how it this is my idea page you know and, and here is where I'm working out the ideas for uh, me pitching the story to Pam and right after the first ten page story we pull back and she's looking at the, the last page of of the story that I opened the book with and that so that's her doing that and what do we have over here. And then, and then it's just me going, well, wait a minute, maybe I got something else you'll like. And uh, so that's just sort of the look of how this is. So it's sort of me and her bantering back and forth. She complains that I make her too mean in the story. But, uh, you know, I say to her, honey, it's the Pam Butler character. Uh, we got It's not you. Uh, but we had a lot of great. Yeah. We'll look but, forward to the next Story. Well, yeah, I, me too. But yeah, yeah, you know, I'm working night and day on it, and keeping things interesting. And like I said, you know, this time, you know, I, I fear I'm doing better than a lot of people because what do I do? Most of the time, I am home anyway. I mean, so now that this thing's going on, there's a lot of places I don't have to go and be interrupted by. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's a bowl of cherries or anything, but yeah. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I've always been lucky. You know, uh, 
fortunate. Well, thank you so much for meeting us here today. And I guess oh, we'll, you're, you're welcome. You've been instructed to just keep smiling and they'll, um, and they'll log us out. Thank you again. It's oh, been you're a, quite welcome. a pleasure to talk with you about the work. Likewise, I'm sure. So, so long. <laughs>